Hello there and uh, welcome to this uh, second talk on heart failure investigations and management. Uh, as always you'll see my disclaimer up in the uh, top of the slide here. So this is purely for educational purposes and no clinical decisions should be made uh, based on what you heard today. Uh, the learning objectives are laid out on this slide and you can read them, you can pause and read them as you see fit. It's up to you to decide whether or not you think those learning objectives have been met uh, in the, this lecture. So in the first uh, lecture of this series we talked about heart failure, the pathophysiology, how it comes about. And a lot of what we're talking about is based on uh, that talk. Uh, so hopefully uh, based on uh, part one, what I'm going to talk about the history, the examination, the investigations uh, will all fit in and make sense from what you've learned already and built on that, build on that scaffold. Uh, I hope that you'll be able to describe the cause, severity and stage of the heart failure syndrome and apply it to the patient in front of you. And really, uh, from a ward round perspective or for presenting patients, I would expect you to be able to say at the end of taking a history and appropriate investigations, what has caused the heart failure and equally important, what is the heart failure causing and what problems is the patient suffering from? So let's start with the tests. So patients uh, with heart failure warrant a comprehensive evaluation. So if at a, a, a bare minimum, from a laboratory perspective, we should check a full blood count, in particular looking for anemia, because anemia can mimic heart failure. And uh, anemia often runs hand in hand with heart failure, and often treating anemia in heart failure can improve patient symptoms. A renal profile is essential to ascertain uh, renal function and it's very important to know the renal function before commencing pharmacotherapy. We'd like to know the liver function test. The liver function test can be deranged as a result of heart failure, a thing called congestive hepatopathy, uh, and it's very important to monitor liver function tests going forward, particularly if they're abnormal to start. We need a fasting glucose to outrule diabetes, and diabetes often runs hand in hand with heart failure. We need to know the lipid profile of the patient, because patients with higher cholesterol are often more prone to ischemic cardiomyopathy. Thyroid function tests are essential because dysthyroidemia can exacerbate the heart failure syndrome and in severe cases, uh, severe dysthyroidemia can actually drive heart failure itself. Brain natriuretic peptide, which is a whole talk in itself, is uh, often and nearly always now measured in patients with known or suspected heart failure. In general, uh, you consider brain natriuretic peptide to be the white cell count of heart failure. It's generally elevated in patients with heart failure Tracking its course can help work out how patients are responding to treatment, but equally importantly, some patients with severe heart failure will actually not have an elevated uh, BNP, in much the same way as some patients with severe sepsis may not have an elevated white cell count. So like any test, it has a certain sensitivity and specificity, uh, and in the case of BNP, BNP is very sensitive and very specific, but it's not perfect. An ECG is mandatory in patients with known or suspected uh, heart failure. It's very, um, it's very rare to have a totally normal ECG in heart failure. Uh, on the other hand, the pattern of ECG abnormality in patients with heart failure varies enormously. For example, if a patient had ischemic cardiomyopathy and a previous infarction, you might expect to see Q waves. In patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, you might see diffuse ST changes or T wave inversion. Uh, but to be fair, it can be very difficult to ascertain the etiology of the heart failure just based on an ECG alone. A chest x-ray could be very useful, especially in patients who present acutely, to ascertain uh, the degree of pulmonary congestion, if any. The echocardiogram remains king, really, to ascertain whether the heart failure uh, is due to predominantly systolic or diastolic dysfunction. It's very important because ejection fraction provides prognostic information. Similarly, concomitant valvular heart disease uh, is a very important part of the heart failure syndrome. Uh, in some cases, it may not be clear whether the heart failure is due to a valvular lesion in the first place, because when patients present, it, they can be fairly advanced. Not every patient needs the other tests, which would include a coronary angiogram, a right heart catheterization, and there is a special talk on right heart catheterization if you go onto my channel on YouTube. Cardiac CT can be useful for evaluating the coronary arteries non-invasively. And finally, cardiac uh, MRI has a growing role in the management of patients, the management of patients with heart failure. So, when assessing and treating patients, here's a list of things we'd like to do. Well, we'd like to make people live longer, in other words, reduce mortality. But equally importantly for the patient, we want to improve their quality of life. We'd like to make them run faster. We'd like to be able to maybe retard or even reverse disease uh, progression. 
Every patient requires a package of tailored care and we'd like to provide that. It's also very important to know when to call it a day. In other words, if you have a very frail elderly patient, it's important to know when to call the family and say, look, things have gone as far as they can and we've got to move to a palliative strategy. Or alternatively, in somebody who may be transplant eligible, it's important to identify patients for transplant so that they're not too far advanced uh, to get a transplant. So it's all about timing and it's all about knowing your patient longitudinally to know when to change strategy. It's very important when you're starting out to stage heart failure. You've got to make a clear diagnosis. So establishing the etiology is also a very important part of that. Is it alcoholic cardiomyopathy? Is it familial dilated cardiomyopathy? Is it ischemic cardiomyopathy? Is it the cardiomyopathy of tachycardia? And so on. It's also important to know where the patient sits. So when you see a patient, you might see them for the first time. Is this a new patient just arriving or is it somebody who has a known diagnosis? Or is it somebody who's done well and relapsed? Or is it somebody who's attending you for advanced heart failure therapies? It's very important to stage the patient. A, B, C and D as previously discussed. And it's also important to describe the NIHA class, the NYHA class, 1 to 4. In addition to that, we'd like to be able to ascertain the patient's volume status. Are they volume overloaded, which is wet, or volume depleted, which is dry? And similarly, is the patient warm and well perfused, at rest, or are they at rest suffering from reduced cardiac output? Because we will change our management, acutely particularly, depending on all of these factors. So just to remind us of the stages of heart failure, these were recently revised. They're a little bit confusing, but worth going through. So this is a consensus document from the Heart Failure Society of America and other international societies. So stage A heart failure is where we have risk factors for heart failure, but actually we don't have heart failure, and that creates a little bit of confusion. So in someone who has diabetes, maybe someone who smokes, someone with hypertension or that left ventricular hypertrophy would be said to have stage A heart failure which some people would say isn't heart failure at all, but it's been given a stage to highlight the importance of treating uh, risk factors before the heart failure syndrome develops. Stage B is frequently encountered, and that's where we have an abnormal heart, but never had heart failure. There's patients with left ventricular hypertrophy on an echo, or left ventricular dysfunction, or perhaps may, maybe an acute myocardial infarction, where the patient uh, hasn't presented with heart failure, but we know uh, that there's a structurally abnormal heart due to an occluded coronary artery. Stage C is probably the most commonly encountered stage of heart failure. It's what we know when we see patients presenting with symptomatic heart failure or who previously presented with symptomatic heart failure. For example, a patient with non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy who comes to clinic and is on treatment may not have been hospitalised ever, but maybe initially presented with symptoms. They would be what's called stage C heart failure. Stage D heart failure is advanced heart failure where really our options are becoming thin on the ground, the patient has been medicated, and treated as part of a disease management program to the best of our abilities, but is still suffering uh, from significant heart failure symptoms. And in those patients, we need to consider transplant mechanical assist device and perhaps palliative care. So we find the patient moves from stage A to stage D, and almost by definition, you really can't go from stage D back to stage C unless in extraordinary circumstances. For example, transplantation. This is the NEHA, the New York Heart Association of Functional Classification. Like all these things, the easiest way to remember is to remember the two extremes. So class one means no symptoms with ordinary activity. Now, it's hard to define what ordinary activity is, and that may vary whether you're eight or 80. Stage four is quite easy to understand because that basically means you can't really do anything uh, without having trouble, without having discomfort. What's very important to note is that the NIHA classification, the NYH classification, it's a functional classification, and it refers to impairment of function. It's not a breathlessness or a dyspnea score. So if you say someone is NYHA class 2 dyspnea, that's not really the way you're meant to say it. You're meant to say they have NYHA class 2 symptoms, which in this patient is resulting in breathlessness. But of course, limitation of physical activity can be related to fatigue, chest discomfort, or even a discomfort of palpitation in the chest. So it doesn't actually have to be breathlessness, though in fairness, breathlessness is the most commonly cited symptom. So having staged the patient, having described their NYHA or NEHA classification, we'd then like to see where the patient sits with regard to their volume status and their cardiac output. So this is what's called the two-minute assessment. And as you can see from the slide here, what we'd like to work out is, is the patient volume overload? 
In other words, are they wet? So if they're wet, they can be warm and wet, in other words, have an adequate cardiac output at rest, but be volume overloaded. Or are they cold and wet, in other words, have a low cardiac output at rest and excess fluid? Or are they warm and dry? Have they been over-diuresed or have they had vomiting or diarrhoea uh, and or maybe an overdose of diuretic in combination with all of these so that they're adequate, they have an adequate cardiac output at rest but uh, their volume depleted? And finally, could they be cold and dry? In other words, where they have uh, reduced cardiac output at rest and their volume depleted? Because our management strategy will largely depend on which of the four boxes the patient fits into. So how do we assess this? Well, how do we know somebody is wet? How do we know someone is volume overloaded? We'll look for symptoms and signs. So the symptoms you might expect would be breathlessness because they may have an element of pulmonary congestion particularly, orthopnea, they're not able to lie flat without getting uh, breathless, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, which essentially means waking up in the middle of the night breathless, and peripheral edema. Now the problem with peripheral edema is it's not very specific and people can get peripheral edema for a variety of reasons from deep venous incompetence, from a deep venous thrombosis, from being obese, and from calcium channel antagonists, for example, amlodipine and lercandipine, which are commonly used in patients who develop the heart failure syndrome later on. The signs you might expect to see if someone is volume overloaded, well, you might see, a, you might see an elevation of the jugular venous pulsation. You might detect edema, because remember, edema is both a sign and a symptom. There might be evidence clinically of pulmonary congestion which manifests itself as crepitations, wheeze, there might be evidence of dullness to percussion or an effusion on the chest x-ray, oh, sorry, on examination, or the chest x-ray may show frank congestion. You may be able to tap out ascites or do a scan and confirm ascites, and an ultrasound may similarly uh, indicate hepatic congestion. So it's difficult to ascertain who's wet and who's dry, but it's perhaps even more difficult to ascertain who is cold, or who is reduced cardiac output. The symptoms are very vague, but often the patient will complain of profound fatigue and weakness. Occasionally they'll present obtunded, really very able to do very little and very, very poorly communicative, and they'll often have slow mentation. But these are all very difficult uh, symptoms to tease out, and unless you know your patient very well, it can be very difficult to assess a change. For example, if you have a frail elderly patient who you've never met before, there are many other reasons why all these symptoms might be present, in addition to heart failure. The signs you might expect might be pallor. Objectively, you'd find the urinary output is tailing off. You might, but not always, see a low blood pressure. And a very important sign is a rapidly rising urea and creatinine, because when the creatinine particularly is rising rapidly, that's a very firm indicator of reduced renal perfusion, and renal perfusion is a good indicator of cardiac output. But the truth is it can be very hard to tell and it can be particularly difficult, especially when you've never met a patient before and you don't know them, to put them into one of these four categories. So what might you do? Well, there are other ways of looking at it and one is the right heart catheterization, which I briefly mentioned. This is also called a Swan-Gans catheter and it means passing one of these fine bore tubes in through a vein, for example, in the arm or the leg or the neck, uh, into the right heart and directly measuring the pressure and importantly, measuring the cardiac output. And from right heart catheterization, we can measure filling pressures, in other words, whether the, uh, whether the uh, patient is wet, which would be elevated filling pressure, or dry, which would be reduced filling pressure. And similarly, we can directly assess the cardiac output. In other words, is the cardiac output adequate at rest, in which case the patient is warm, or is the cardiac output reduced at rest, in which case the patient is cold. There's a whole other talk uh, I have on right heart catheterization on my YouTube channel, so please feel free to listen to it. It's fairly short and maybe it'll throw some light on it for those of you not familiar with this technology. In thinking about right heart catheterization, you've got to think of the chambers in the heart and the knock-on effects. So for example, if the patient is congested, then you're going to have back pressure and you'll find an elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And depending on the situation in the right heart, you're going to see elevation of the jugular venous pulsation. So this slide here summarises what you might expect to see on a pulmonary artery catheter. I'm not going to go through it, I'll let you read it at your leisure. So this slide is just meant to tell you that really it can be tricky to work it all out. 
sometimes it's just not clear. You don't really know are you wet or are you dry, and you don't really know what the output is. And that's the time you might reach the swan gans catheter. And it's particularly pertinent in patients who have complex medical disease. For example, if someone has heart failure and in addition to that, maybe a, a GI bleed, or maybe they have intercurrent sepsis, and you're not clear which the predominant problem is. So having assessed the patient and deciding whether they're warm or cold or wet or dry, you want to start treating the patient. Briefly, if the patient is wet, they require diuretics to reduce the volume. If the patient is dry, they require a reduction in diuretics and occasionally intravenous fluids. If the patient has a low cardiac output arrest with deteriorating uh, organ perfusion, they will often need an inotrope, which might be dibutamine or noradrenaline. They may also benefit from afterload reduction, which could be in the form of intravenous nitrates, nitroprusside, or ACE inhibitors. What you want is a well-perfused patient at an ideal volume, and that can be difficult to achieve. So moving on to the treatment of heart failure, I think of treatment in heart failure in three Ds. The diet, which I include lifestyle, the drugs or medications, and finally devices, and into devices we put all surgical approaches to the management of heart failure. So let's start with diet. So diet and lifestyle. So really, we have to recognise that heart failure is a chronic medical condition, in many ways similar to something like diabetes. So if you just focus on medication, you'll miss a lot of the treatment. And it requires input from a multidisciplinary team, with a heart failure nurse as central in uh, disease management uh, delivery. Education is incredibly important, and the education has to be tailored to the individual patient's needs. In other words, some patients like to know all the technical details, and other patients just can't handle it. But so you've got to know your patient and tailor your education. Similarly, you've got to re-educate the patient. Nothing is ever learned on the first go. And using this approach, we feel we have a holistic approach to managing patients with heart failure. So a few very obvious and simple things. Don't make a bad situation worse. So alcohol is not to be recommended in patients with heart failure. Patients shouldn't smoke, and they should be routinely asked about other drugs of abuse which can exacerbate the heart failure syndrome. Salt restriction is recommended because with salt comes water. So if you if you increase your salt, if you have an increased salt intake or even any additional salt intake, uh, you will retain fluid, particularly if you suffer from the heart failure syndrome. We don't uh, remove all salt from the diet. In other words, a, a salt-free diet is very unpalatable and can actually lead to malnutrition. So we have no salt policy to be added to the patients. And it's important for the patients to understand that salt isn't just what you put on the table. Salt is in a lot of processed foods and they require specific dietetic advice in this regard. Fluid restriction is slightly controversial. For patients with very severe heart failure, we do recommend fluid restriction to maybe one and a half or two litres a day. When patients are doing well and back in the community, we can often just ask the patient to drink to thirst. But it is fair to say that uh, patients do need to keep an eye on their fluid intake and to avoid the temptation uh, to take uh, large amounts of fluid because quite simply, it will result in an exacerbation of their heart failure syndrome. Work-life balance is incredibly important. It can be very difficult living with heart failure. While as many patients will continue to live an active life and continue to work, they need support in this area. Exercise is extremely important in patients uh, with heart failure. And even if it's only a walk around the block, they need to be encouraged to take regular exercise at all times. Education is based on teaching the patient a little bit about the condition as much as they can handle, a basic understanding of their medicines because that increases compliance. We try to get our patients to self-medicate with diuretics once they're comfortable, others to know when to take an additional amount of diuretic if they're becoming volume overloaded. And the way the patient assesses that is they weigh themselves daily. And if there's more than two pounds increase in weight over two days, that's fluid and they need to adjust the diuretic dose. They also know, need to know when and who to call for help. Until the advent of disease management programs for heart failure, these patients present to emergency departments uh, almost universally. And uh, really, the area of primary care is not equipped to handle patients with recurrent decompensated heart failure. It's important in a very sensitive way to explain the natural history of the heart failure syndrome to the patient, in much the same way as if somebody had a disease like cancer. 
Family screening is indicated in patients with familial forms of cardiomyopathy and it's very important that the patient is educated uh, and, encouraged, and, and encourages their family to go forward for screening appropriately because early intervention before the heart failure syndrome develops, particularly in the area of asymptomatic left ventricular dysfunction, is, is very important and can stave off the development of full-blown heart failure. There's a very important role of palliative care in heart failure, which has really only come to the fore with international societies in the last year. But it is essential that you either provide palliative care through your own unit or in combination with the palliative care services of your institution. So let's move on to drugs. <clears throat> this is not meant to be comprehensive, it's just a rough guide to the drugs used in the treatment of heart failure. We can broadly divide them into the diuretics, the ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, beta blockers, aldosterone antagonists, digoxin, ithabrodine and hydralazine and nitrates. I briefly mentioned the use of inotropes, which I'm not going to discuss any further, but inotropes are for patients with end organ hypoperfusion uh, as a bridge to other therapies or in anticipation of resolution of an intercurrent illness, for example, a chest infection, pneumonia, bleed, etc., from which you hope the patient will get over, or alternatively, while we're waiting for response to therapy. So, a few important things about medications. Even if the patient is feeling well, there are certain medications like ACE inhibitors and beta blockers that have to be up titrated. And in fact, as you up titrate the medication, the patient may feel a little bit less well, but you're improving prognosis and reducing heart failure admissions. It's essential to understand that no drugs, and this is as late as 2014, appear to improve the prognosis in patients with heart failure in the setting of preserved ejection fraction. And that is an area of great disappointment uh, for people dealing with heart failure reserve ejection fraction but as of now there are no drugs that improve prognosis. Certainly there are drugs that improve the quality of life in the form of diuretics, concomitant treatment of hypertension and avoiding complications but no drugs improve prognosis and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The other incredible thing about the medications we use for the heart is many drugs in heart failure they don't seem to affect the heart directly, they affect the systemic vasculature, they have renal effects, and although they affect the heart in some cases, we don't really know how they do it, and that can be a little, uh, a little bit of a mystery, but they work, we know they work. I sometimes think of the drugs used for the heart as chemotherapy for the heart. So let's talk about diuretics. Well, diuretics are like the insulin of heart failure. They're a variable dose prescription. Every patient needs a different dose of insulin, and depending on the patient's needs, age, and stage of heart failure, the amount of diuretic that they require uh, will be adjusted. Ideally, we like the patient to adjust it themselves. Much like insulin, you can get it, uh, you can get it in different methodologies and me different method of delivery. So we can give diuretics orally, which is the most common. We can give an intravenous bolus for a sick patient who's hospitalized or an outpatient who requires frequent uh, diuretic pulses. Or finally, we can give it in, as an intravenous infusion. It's important to know that diuretics alone do not improve survival in patients with heart failure. They certainly improve symptoms. You would be very foolish just to use diuretics as monotherapy because people who are just on diuretics alone develop resistance uh, to diuretics at the level of the kidney. And of course you can get profound electrolyte disturbances, for example hypokalemia, low potassium, hypomagnesemia, low magnesium. And it's very important to know that we use diuretics in patients who are volume overloaded and in patients who are at a steady volume, we keep them on the lowest dose of diuretic to stop them retaining fluid. So this slide just outlines a few of the diuretics used. So let's go through the choices and doses. Well, we can have loop diuretics, so-called loop diuretics, because they work in the loop of Henley. The most commonly prescribed uh, drug in our institution would be fruzamide, and the dose varies enormously from as little as 20 milligrams to 240 milligrams per day, often given in divided doses. Bumetanide is also an option. We put in 0.5 and 5 milligrams total dose of the day again in divided doses. And uh, torazamide uh, has been shown to be effective in patients maybe who have resistance to either of those drugs. Working differently uh, on the distal tubule effectively, thiazides are very powerful diuretics and particularly powerful if they're used in combination with loop diuretics. So we'd often use metalazone, somewhere between 2.5 and 10 milligrams per day, again divided doses in this case. We often use metalazone on alternate days indeed. Hydrochlorothiazide is useful as well. That's often used as a combination with antihypertensives. Bendorfurimethiazide, again, a very uh, well-established drug used in the treatment of congestion and particularly useful if combined with the loop diuretic to, to diurese the patient. 
Indapamide is a, is a very good antihypertensive and, and may also be used uh, to, to diurese the patient. Of course, all these agents are diuretics, but primarily they're naturetics. In other words, they cause the loss of sodium through the kidney. And as sodium is lost, so is water. So the only uh, absolute pure diuretics would be things that, like osmotic diuretics, like mannitol, which we rarely use, or mercury, which was used as, a, as an osmotic diuretic. Uh, so really, these agents technically should be called naturetic in the sense that they primarily cause the loss of sodium, but with the loss of sodium comes the loss of water. So if you think about that, it makes sense that you know, the side effects and the concerns that you might have with diuretics would include electrolyte disturbances. Because of the rapid flow of fluid through the kidney, you don't have time to equilibrate. So you find you can lose potassium, you can lose sodium, you can lose magnesium, and all of these uh, can drop in patients on high doses of diuretics, particularly if you're using diuretics in combination. And these need to be supplemented. Inevitably, urea will rise if you over diurese, and creatinine can rise if renal perfusion is compromised based on uh, a grossly volume depleted state. Interestingly, in a patient who comes in congested, uh, often the creatinine will drop as you use a diuretic because indirectly renal perfusion improves. It's important to note that diuretics shouldn't be used as monotherapy, they shouldn't be used alone. The side effects are worth talking about and we like patients to be stable for 48 hours on an oral dose before they discharge from the hospital. So when you think about diuretics, and I've included both thiazides and loop diuretics, for adverse effects. So we talked about electrolyte disturbances. You get a, a react, an activation of rebound neurohormonal activity. So you get a dramatic rise in aldosterone, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, antidiuretic hormone, uh, and endothelin in response to diuretic use. You can get hyperuricemia and gout, and this is not an uncommon presentation of people who start on diuretics. If you over deplete the patient of volume, you can get a low blood pressure or hypotension. Because of the way the inner ear works, it's very similar to the kidney, ototoxicity can occur, particularly with loop diuretics. Metabolic alkalosis because uh, of loss of hydrogen ions, uh, again because of the rapid flux of fluid and ions through the tubule can result. And of course GI side effects uh, can occur uh, pretty much with all medications, but in particular with diuretics. So the next class of drugs we want to talk about are ACE inhibitors are so-called angiotensin-converting inhibitors. Now, ACE inhibitors uh, are essential in the management of all classes and all stages of heart failure. So no patient should be uh, let off without thinking about an ACE inhibitor, even if the patient feels real, real well on the uh, diuretic. We know that ACE inhibitors improve symptoms, they improve survival, they can retard adverse left ventricular remodeling, we talked about remodeling at the first talk, and they may even reverse it in total. So we've seen people whose ejection fractions can dramatically improve just by the use of an ACE inhibitor. I put the ACE rules here and they're very important. We start low and go fairly slow, so it's important that we start at a low dose. And I've listed the doses up here, you can read them off. We start at a low dose and we go up titrating them. If they're in hospital, we can up titrate them every few hours or every day. If they're an outpatient, we might decide to up titrate them every week. And this is where disease management clinics have proved particularly useful. It's essential to monitor potassium and creatinine in patients with uh, ACE inhibition on board, and particularly when you're trying to titrate them, and in particular when you're using them with other agents, for example the mineralocorticoids, which I'll discuss, including spironolactone and aldactone. Sorry, and, and, and deplernal. We shouldn't be using ACE inhibitors if the creatinine is greater than 180. If there's bilateral renal artery stenosis, because in those cases, we make renal function an awful lot worse. They're contraindicated in pregnancy because of renal failure of the newborn and teratogenicity. And they're not recommended in patients with hyperkalemia with potassium greater than 5.5. This uh, section of the slide just shows us the, com shows us the commonest drugs used. Uh, pril is how you know it's an ACE inhibitor. Captopril, enalopril, lisinopril, ramipril, and perendopril. And the doses are laid out here. We start slow, start low and then up titrate to the maximum tolerated dose, not just when the patient feels better. So when the patient feels well, we keep pushing the ACE inhibitor up as high as we can. I've listed the side effects here. Hypotension is a side effect of all these agents. Remember, ACE inhibitors were initially brought out 
as blood pressure medications. So it's no big surprise that they lower your blood pressure uh, and they can cause uh, symptoms related to that. You can get a cough from an ACE inhibitor due to the buildup of bradykinin. You can get angioedema, which it can be quite severe. Uh, rash is not uncommon with ACE inhibitors. Neutropenia is a rare side effect, but if the patient is prone to infection, it's very important to check a uh, full blood count uh, following introduction of an ACE inhibitor. And it can inter interfere with the, taste, with the sense of taste. So in patients who cannot tolerate ACE inhibitors, typically for a cough, angiotensin receptor blockers can be tried. And angiotensin receptor blockers work further down the pathway. They are not better than ACE inhibitors. So the rule of thumb is start with an ACE inhibitor. If the ACE inhibitor is not tolerated, then try an angiotensin receptor blocker. There are no data to support combining angiotensin receptor blockers with ACE inhibitors, and there is a tendency for harm, so I would not recommend this. ACE inhibitors are good and should be tried first. If you want to use an ARB, having failed an ACE inhibitor, the studies have indicated that three ACE inhibitors, candesartan, valsartan and losartan, in the doses described here, are very acceptable alternatives. Side effects can include hypotension, electrolyte disturbance, and you do need to monitor potassium and creatinine levels in patients as you optitrate these agents in much the same way as you do for an ACE inhibitor. And again, you get the patient on the highest tolerated dose. So even if the patient feels very well and is coming back to clinic, it's your job to uptitrate the dose to the highest tolerated. How do ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptors block, receptors block work? Well, I will allow you to download your own diagram because there's many on the internet. But essentially, the way they work is they dampen down the neurohormonal activation, which occurs in the heart failure symptom, syndrome, and in particular in the heart failure syndrome in patients with diuretics. They also reduce afterload, and by reducing the afterload, they increase the effective forward ejection during systole and effectively improve the cardiac output. That's how they work. Let's move on to beta blockers. When some people were going through training, uh, they were told that beta blockers would be a bad thing in heart failure, might actually make it worse. And it actually took a lot of courage for the early trialists to prove that uh, beta blockers reduce mortality in heart failure. And although they don't improve symptoms in the short run, by reducing hospital admissions, they have a profound effect for the quality of life of the patients. They're now indicated in all patients with heart failure of all stages except the, severe, the severely decompensated hospitalised patient, the so-called class 4, in which case the only medication in the beta blocker class that may prove beneficial would be carvedilol. Uh, it's important to note, however, that carvedilol in very ill patients must be used with extreme caution. So essentially, the bluffers guide would say class 1, 2 and 3 heart failure, irrespective of ejection fraction, probably benefits from ACE inhibitor, sorry, from beta blockers, uh, I say probably because in the absence of left ventricular dysfunction, there's only a very small sub-study showing a benefit uh, with nubivalol. Now, when you're using beta blockers, you'd like the patient to be in their Goldilocks place. You don't want them to be too wet, you don't want them to be too dry, and you'd like to, them to have an adequate cardiac output at rest. So a very ill, hospitalised patient may not be the time to uh, add in the beta blocker, the beta blocker, once we start it, we uptitrate it slowly and it can take weeks or even months to uh, get to target doses. Beta blockers work in a variety of ways. They're anti-ischemic, they're anti-arrhythmic, they directly reduce uh, renin-mediated uh, angiotensin release and the release of renin itself. They help to reprogram the fetal heart program. They favorably remodel the heart but like a lot of these things, because they work in so many different ways, we're not actually sure how they work because they seem to work on everything. But take my word for it, they work. So let's have a look at who might get a beta blocker. So this is at any degree of heart failure except perhaps class 4, any degree of left ventricular systolic dysfunction associated with symptomatic heart failure, and also asymptomatic people with an EF lower than 40. The big unanswered question is, if the EF is greater than 40, between 40 and 60, What's the benefit of beta blockers? And the jury is a little bit out on that one. And as I mentioned, in patients with heart failure, 
and preserve systolic function, disappointingly we don't have a huge evidence base to show an improvement in survival. You've got to work hard to get your patient on a beta blocker. You want to start low and go slow. And as you increase the beta blocker dose, you may need to increase the diuretic because the patient's heart failure symptoms may transiently deteriorate. And again, this is best done on a slow up titration through a heart failure disease management program led by a dedicated heart failure team. I've listed here the drugs that are approved for use in heart failure. And what we see here is uh, I'm sorry, uh, I don't know what ground one's got into the system there. We jumped a bit sideways on the slides, but anyway, this uh, indicates here the beta blockers that are used, they're licensed and recommended for use. So we've bisoprolol, carvedilol, nabivolol, and metoprolol, and uh, as you can see, they end in all. That's how you know they're the beta blockers. So it's not at all unusual to have side effects uh, from beta blockers, including low blood pressure and the transient worsening of the heart failure syndrome. Uh, we've got to watch the heart rate because what we want to do is reduce the resting heart rate to 60 beats per minute, but inadvertently we can cause AV block if we push up the beta blockers too high. So it's really important that we see uh, patients uh, in the context of all their other medications and we'll often do ECGs on patients as we up titrate the beta blockers specifically for atrioventricular block. In patients who can't tolerate beta blockers there's a newer drug called Ivabradine which is an entirely uh, new way of treating it whereby the Ivabradine just affects the sinus node. I'll briefly mention that in a couple of slides down the road. Uh, if somebody uh, is uh, disimproving with their heart failure syndrome, we're very reluctant to discontinue beta blockers. If somebody's volume overloaded and requires admission, then on occasion we reduce the beta blocker dosage by half during the index admission. The next class of drugs are the mineralocorticoid antagonists. And we have only two drugs in this class commonly used, spironolactone and aplironol. These are said to be potassium sparing. Uh, they uh, antagonize endogenously produced uh, endosterone, uh, aldosterone. So we have three different studies uh, that confirm the utility of spironolactone and plurinone uh, and the uh, main side effects uh, of mastodynia and gynecomastia, so enlarged and painful breasts, tend to occur only at spironolactone and plurinone is considered an improvement uh, because uh, you don't get these particular side effects and there is a body of recent evidence in favour of the use of a plurinone in, these patients pop in this patient population. Um, so we don't like to use mineralocorticoid antagonists in patients uh, who have significant renal impairment or if their potassium is elevated because if the potassium is elevated to start if you add in one of these agents particularly if the patient is on an ACE inhibitor they may get potentially fatal hyperkalemia. So it's really important that we uh, follow urine electrolyte levels and particularly potassium levels when we infuse these drugs. However, these are profoundly useful drugs to reduce readmissions from heart failure and they're indicated in patients with class 2 to 4 heart failure. They tend to be fairly benign vis-a-vis -vis blood pressure so we don't see an awful lot of low blood pressure with them. The doses are titrated according to the patient's renal function and response to therapy uh, but we'd like to get uh, patients between 25 and 50 milligrams on a plurinone uh, and somewhere up to 50 milligrams of spironolactone. If the patient isn't on an ACE inhibitor or, or an aldosterone antagonist, sorry, or, or, or an angiotensin receptor blocker, it is acceptable to push the spironolactone dose up higher, particularly if the patient, for example, has ascites where spironolactone is commonly used. So I'm going to spin through a couple of other drugs in heart failure. I've averaged in and mentioned it's a purely sinus node slowing agent. Uh, if the patient's heart rate is greater than 70, despite maximum beta blockade, Ivabradine should be added and up titrated to achieve a heart rate between 60 and 70. Some patients are intolerant to beta blockers and it's felt that Ivabradine may be useful in these patients to reduce hospitalizations. Digoxin was the mainstay of heart failure treatment for many years. Uh, it's not felt to be particularly useful nowadays unless the patient is in atrial fibrillation where digoxin is an excellent rate controlling agent. And it can be used in patients with severe LV dysfunction if we can't use beta blockers or other agents. Hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate combination have been shown to be a reasonable alternative in patients who can take ACE inhibitors or ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers, because of renal impairment. They've often been used as an addition to these agents when the patient is symptomatic 
despite maximum dose of ACE inhibitor. If the patient has atrial fibrillation, we need to anticoagulate them because the risk of stroke is very high in patients with atrial fibrillation uh, and heart failure. We use statins for reducing vascular risk at those uh, at, at risk of stroke, for example. And we use inotropes in patients with reduced cardiac output at rest uh, as a bridge to recovery or as a bridge to more heroic therapies. So what don't we use? Well, glitazones used widely for diabetes are contraindicated because of salt and water retention. We absolutely do not use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, uh, which include the COX-2 inhibitors, because by inhibiting prostaglandin synthesis in the kidney, we can cause a severe salt and water retaining state. And uh, inadvertent use of non-steroidals is a very common reason for patients who have been heretofore stable with the heart failure syndrome to acutely decompensate and require admission. We don't use combinations of ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and calcium channel blockers, with the exception of philodipine, which may have benefit, and amlodipine, which is neutral, are generally avoided in patients with heart failure unless they have significant hypertension that requires treatment. So let's move on to device therapy then for heart failure. So by devices, I mean pretty much anything that doesn't involve popping a pill in itself. So we'll include bypass surgery or angioplasty in selected cases. This is a highly controversial area. For patients with severe multivessel disease and angina, uh, uh, bypass is probably indicated. In the absence of angina, recent studies have indicated that it may not provide a survival advantage. It may reduce hospitalizations, but the jury is very much out. Similarly for angioplasty and stenting, if the patient has angina, it's probably reasonable. In the absence of angina, uh, it is difficult to know where angioplasty sits in these patients, though it is frequently used. It is also worth pointing out that in some patients, angina may be breathlessness. And so an anginal equivalent of breathlessness may be difficult to, dis to uh, distinguish from the symptoms of heart failure. And in some patients, we empirically revascularize in the hope of improving breathlessness. Valve surgery is very important. In other words, if the valve is the primary problem, providing left ventricular systolic function is reasonable, we can get the patient through surgery, there is a role for valve surgery. In rare cases where there's functional mitral regurgitation, in other words, where the valve, the mitral valve is leaking because the heart muscle is enlarged, consideration of repair of the mitral valve and with the advent of percutaneous mitral valve repair, this is becoming a more viable option for some patients. Left ventricular reconstruction involves surgically excising an area of previous myocardial infarction, most typically the apex of the heart. This proved very promising in early studies, but again, recent data would indicate that it has no definite survival advantage, but there are still some indications. Cardiac transplantation, we'll briefly mention. We'll briefly talk about mechanical circulatory support devices, and we'll talk about implantable cardiac devices in the form of defibrillators, pacemakers, etc. Just a quick word on transplantation. Transplant is a viable option for patients who have single system disease. In other words, they're dying from heart failure. The problem with transplantation is it's often too early until it's too late. In other words, the patient's clinical course has been declining, but by the time they're referred for transplant, they have significant comorbidities which make them non-transplant eligible. Objectively, we can do a cardiopulmonary exercise stress test, and if their maximum uptake of oxygen is less than 12 mg per kilogram per minute, if on a beta blocker, then transplantation may have prognostic advantage. Uh, Ventricular arrhythmias, uh, which are unresponsive to all therapeutic modalities, can also represent an indication, although this is less so with the advent of advanced uh, electrophysiologic techniques. Age is still considered a contraindication, particularly in patients over 65 or 70, and severe comorbidities where it's felt that uh, the patient will not survive the lifespan of the transplant would also be considered contraindications. Mechanical circulatory support devices come in a variety of shapes and sizes, from the intraaortic balloon pump to what's called extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, or ECMO. ECMO is effectively a heart-lung machine, uh, which is typically performed through peripheral cannulation, for example, through the femoral artery and vein. So it's like being in a heart-lung machine. An intraaortic balloon pump is typically inserted from the femoral artery, it sits in the descending aorta, 
and counter pulses in diastole to force blood down the coronary arteries and to force blood to the other organs including the kidneys. This is effective reducing the afterload and improves cardiac output. And it's very important that an intraortic balloon pump, for example, if someone has an acute valvular problem or an acute myocardial infarction, can provide a bridge whilst, for example, the heart is being revascularized, there's myocardial recovery or salvage, or the patient is going to have definitive treatment, for example, acute valve surgery or in the aforementioned transplant case. An intraortic balloon pump in and of itself, however, doesn't cure heart failure and it should be viewed as a stopgap and there should be a plan for the patient of what to do once the balloon pump is coming out. If there is no plan, then maybe it's a good idea not to put in the balloon pump in the first place. They're relatively simple to insert, can be done at the bedside or ideally in the cath lab. We don't put them in if there's severe peripheral vascular disease because of the concern of uh, limb loss. And clearly if the patient has severe aortic incompetence, then inflating the balloon and diastole will only force blood back into the heart, so it can't be used in severe aortic incompetence. Ventricular support devices uh, have been around for quite some time. They can be broadly divided into the intra or extra corporeal. They can be in, implanted for left or right ventricular support. We can have short-term percutaneous devices um, or long-term uh, extracorporeal devices. So we have a whole variety. And again, uh, there's a concept arising of what's destination therapy where some patients have these devices and it's realized that they're never going to get any other treatment in the form of transplant and this is their lot. So a whole other area of development uh, worth reading up on, but really nothing I've time to get into today. What's important about the mechanical circulatory support systems is that we have to know what's going to happen next. Are we bridging them to transplant? Are we leaving them there permanently? Which we can't do, for example, with the balloon pump, but we can do for left ventricular assist device. Are we bridging them to eligibility? Are we putting this in with the hope that their kidneys will get better and they may become transplant eligible? Are we putting them in because we think there's acute myocarditis and the patient might get better or respond to immune modulatory therapy and others bridge to recovery? Are we just putting it in to decide what we will do next? Maybe it's all happened too quickly and we haven't had a clear uh, decision about how best to treat the patient, so we need to stabilise the patient so we put in a balloon pump. Or is it a bridge to a bridge? In other words, are we putting a balloon pump with a view to bridging the patient subsequently with, for example, a left ventricular assist device? So because we have all these technologies, what we need is a plan. We need to individualise that plan so that the individual patient will get the most benefit from the device. We're going to fly through a brief discussion of implanted cardiac devices. So, pacemakers for bradyarrhythmias. If a patient has a symptomatically slow heartbeat, they need a pacemaker to bring the heartbeat back to the normal range. That's a no-brainer. Implantable cardiovascular defibrillators and cardiac synchronisation therapy are slightly more complicated, so let's talk about those. For ICDs, we have two classes of patient. One is secondary prevention, where the patient has had a, a, a near-fatal ventricular arrhythmia in the absence of an acute problem. So, for example, if somebody came in and their potassium was 1 and they had ventricular arrhythmia, well, that was secondary to the potassium, so fix the potassium, don't give them an ICD. On the other hand, if their electrolytes were normal, if there wasn't an acute myocardial infarction, then that patient who survived a cardiac arrest should be offered an ICD, providing there's no other uh, competing uh, risk. So in other words, in secondary prevention, we use it in the form uh, of uh, treatment in patients who have had VTVF without a transient or reversible cause. Primary prevention is a bit more difficult. We like to use ICDs in patients who are considered at high risk for fatal ventricular arrhythmias and who are not likely to die from other causes within two years, and that includes heart failure, by the way. And these are typically patients with poor LV function despite optimal medical therapy. And when you're talking to a patient about an ICD, it's really important. The ICD does not improve symptoms, but it improves prognosis in patients as described above. You can think of it like an airbag for the heart. You've probably got an airbag in your car. The airbag will go off and might save your life, but it doesn't make the car any more comfortable doesn't make the car drive any better. It's only there in case of emergency. The other people that might be considered for an ICD, and this isn't purely a heart failure sense, will be people who have symptomatic and sustained ventricular tachycardia if it's associated with hemodynamic compromise and indeed some left ventricular dysfunction. Or occasionally in people who have syncope, those uh, blackouts of spontaneous re resolution of, of, of consciousness, where an electrical study has indicated that they have inducible arrhythmias. 
Other, call, other indications include long QT syndrome, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was one of more risk factors, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy in patients uh, with uh, particularly with documented ventricular arrhythmias, patients with Brugada syndrome, and patients with grown-up congenital uh, repaired tetralogy of fallow. This is not something I talk about today, but this just be a complete list of ICDs. In patients with heart failure, it doesn't matter whether it's ischemic or non-ischemic, if their EF is less than 35% and they've any degree of symptomatology, then I think they should be offered an ICD. In ischemic cardiomyopathy, it's the same to a certain extent. However, if they have moderately depressed LV function with non-sustained ventricular tachycardia or an electrical study of the heart suggests that they have a rhythm problem, they should also be considered. When I say considered, I say consider in the context of complications and implications. So I've listed here the complications of an ICD, and these include infection, bleeding, and a collapsed lung or pneumothorax. Later infections remain, or later infections remain an issue. You can have erosion or migration of the device. You can have shocks when the patient doesn't need it. These are called inappropriate shocks and are very distressing. Depending on how young and active the patient is, you can have lead and device problems and you can require lead revision. And in some patients, they get obstruction of the venous return, typically SVC obstruction, which can lead to significant symptoms and problems. Any patient who has an ICD should know that they require a lifetime of follow-up, that they could get a shock whether inappropriate or appropriate, they're going to have to come for battery changes, perhaps lead revisions, and there could be a psychological impact. Many studies indicate that maybe anxiety is increased, but depression shouldn't be increased by an ICD implant. It's also important to know that when a patient is reading, reaching the end of their life, that uh, an ICD may not be indicated. And it's similarly important to know when to deactivate and turn off therapies and disable alarms. In patients who die where the alarms are still active, alarms can go off in the casket or coffins. This is where palliative care is especially important. So in summary, ICDs make you live longer, they don't make you feel better. They're a high cost, not just financially, they have implications for the life of the patient. Most patients won't get inappropriate shocks from the device of modern therapy, but some will. And I'd make the point that actually inserting an ICD is relatively technically challenging, but it's often the easiest part. It's often managing expectations and choosing your patient carefully, following them up appropriately and offering them support. And that's a much more longitudinal and takes a lot more effort than just putting in the device. A specific type of device that has gained uh, uh, worldwide uh, practice over the last decade has been the use of cardiac resynchronization therapy. And that's also called biventricular pacing. If a patient has left bundle branch block, if their ventricle is dilated, their left ventricle is dilated, and their ejection fraction less than 35%, with a moderate or severe heart failure, despite good treatment, these patients will often benefit from biventricular pacing. And that essentially means inserting a special type of pacemaker where a lead is put in the coronary sinus or it can be done surgically, uh, where a lead is screwed onto the free lateral wall of the left ventricle. And the idea is that this allows a synchronization, so effectively you lose the effect of the left bundle branch block. It improves cardiac output, it improves both symptoms and survival, and can often be uh, the single biggest intervention in the patient. Again, patients need to be selected carefully. So, to summarise then, uh, I'm finishing up with a beautiful photograph of a beautiful part of Ireland uh, called Keen Bay and Ackle. Um, please adopt a comprehensive approach in uh, treating patients with heart failure. Remember the three Ds, diet, drugs and devices. Every patient is different and it's not a one-size-fits-all. You've got to know your patient. It's not just satisfactory to have a once-off encounter. You won't solve it all at the first visit. You need to work as part of a team. And I would argue that the most important part of the team is the heart failure nurse. And really heart failure nurses have revolutionised the management of patients with heart failure. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this talk. Please check out my channel for other content. Uh, and I'd be very grateful for any comments you might have. I know I went on for a long time, but there's a lot to cover. Thank you.